Hello and welcome to part 2A of lecture 4 on business level strategy. We're dealing with three objectives together in these parts, part 2A, part 2B, part 2C. In each of those areas, we're going to look at the differences among business level strategies and explain them. Use the five forces of competi the competition model to explain how above average returns can be earned through each business level strategy and describe the risks of using each business level strategy. So in this part, we're going to do the an overall introduction of business level strategy, building on the EPM video you've just seen. And then I'm going to spend the rest of the time dealing with those three objectives for cost leadership. So here goes. So business level strategies are intended to create differences in the firm's position relative to its rivals. You do that by being able to perform activities differently to your rivals to achieve a lower cost or to be able to perform those activities in a different way to add value to produce different products or different services. To be successful in a chosen strategy, you have to integrate your primary and support activities. The value chain we identified last week when we were linking the value chain to how you add value and integrate integration of primary and support activities into an activity system. So when we, now I know that sounds a bit esoteric, so I'm going to actually explain them in more depth, though you should have a good idea of the direction we're going in if you've watched the EPM video as asked. There are effectively five business level strategies. The five business level strategies are cost leadership, differentiation, focused cost leadership, focused differentiation, and integrated cost leadership differentiation. Now, even though there are five outcomes there, five business level strategies, sometimes they're referred to as three generic strategies that produce these five business level strategies. So sometimes the terms are used interchangeable, interchangeably. Just to make it even more complex, in the olden days, you were only the first four mattered, but we're now in the present time, so we'll talk about integration of cost leadership and differentiation as well. Each business strategy involves choosing a particular scope of operation. You can have a broad target market or a narrow target market. Woolworths, Coles serve a broad target market. They sell to everybody. But you could probably think of a niche local grocer that has a narrow target market. Toyota, broad market. Porsche, focused market. The competitive scope has different dimensions in the product and customer segments that you're trying to service. So the product, you describe your competitive scope, whether it's broad or narrow, based on your product segments or your customer segments. The, and the, remember that we've already defined the customer segments in terms of industrial and consumer. And also the array of geographical markets in which you operate, which we've also defined in terms of global and regional. By combining broad market and narrow market and cost and uniqueness, cost and making a different products, you end up with potentially five ways to take advantage of your values, your, co your core competencies to produce values. Those are based on competitive scope, narrow target market, broad target market, and competitive advantage, low cost or uniqueness. In the past, this one in the middle, you were supposed to not be in. That's called stuck in the middle. But now, because of modern manufacturing techniques and new ways of considering the supply chain, you can integrate both cost leadership and differentiation at the same time. 
So I'm going to define each of these main um, um, uh, as, as generic strategies. And then I'm going to start discussing particular generic strategies and how they create value, how they address the five forces model and the risks of adopting them. And to discuss them, I'm going to discuss them in terms of differentiation, cost leadership and focus. Differentiation, cost leadership and focus. So let's start by talking about cost leadership and what a cost leadership strategy is. A cost leadership strategy is an integrated set of actions designed to produce or deliver goods or services at the lowest cost relative to competitors with features that are acceptable to the customers. So a cost leadership strategy meets customer expectations in an acceptable way, but you're using techniques to be able to reduce the cost of your production and therefore possibly the price of the price of the product. This leads you to be able to offer your product at the lowest competitive price with features acceptable to many customers and you're often producing relatively standardized products. Doesn't mean that you don't have brands to differentiate, but you're differentiating yourself mainly on competitive price. In the value chain, we've already introduced the concept of the value chain, you need to make a series of decisions about firm infrastructure, human resource management, technology, procurement, logistics, operations, outbound logistics, marketing, sales, and service, focusing on achieving cost leadership. Not every firm will be able to make decisions that produce cost leadership in every aspect of their value chain. So that, in a way, is aspirational. So what type of things can they do to create value? They need to, for example, build efficient scale facilities. You don't want your facilities, your manufacturing to be too big or the number of sites you have to be too many in a distribution type retail store. You want to have the right scale of facilities. And one of the videos we're looking at this week is Forever 21. Forever 21 made the mistake of building stores that too many stores that were too big which affected its, and of various different sizes, which has affected its ability to reduce its cost and maintain its fast fashion, cheap cost, high turnover uh, market position. You need to tightly control your production costs and overhead, so you need to have very strong focus on um, um, production costs, you need to simplify the processes and make it efficient. You need to minimize cost of sales, research and development, and service. So frequently you're trying in cost of sales to remove the layers and maybe sell direct to your final consumer. Um, your R&D tends to, in cost leadership, focus on production R&D rather than feature R&D. And you need to monitor costs of activities provided by outsiders. So you need to have a lot of control and be very cost focused, making sure that your inputs into your organization are low cost. So what do you do in that? Efficient management information systems have fewer layers of management, therefore reduce um, the cost of staffing and increase the speed of decision making. Simplified planning processes so that you have consistent processes that are, no, are not overly complex and therefore don't require a lot of resources to operate. Consistent policies so you're not making unique decisions all the time. You've already got a policy that's consistent, that works effectively, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel in any stage of your manufacturing or service provision process. Effective trading, uh, training. Easy to use manufacturing technology, so you do not have to overspend on staffing. Invest in technologies that improve production and find low cost raw materials. 
You need to monitor your supplier's performance to make sure you're getting the best value. Now, sometimes, for example, the cheapest cost into your organization might not be the best value. Think about personally when you buy the cheapest printing pa uh, paper, the cheapest um, A4 paper available, and you put it in your printer and it jams all the time. Even though you've got the cheapest paper, you don't have the most efficient production of whatever you're printing, and you get wasting, wastage in your printing process. The same thing applies to any, any step in manufacturing. You link suppliers' products to the production processes, possibly to reduce the amount of steps you take or to, in fact, ensure that um, you have just-in-time delivery so you don't have to maintain large amounts of warehouse stock, but you're, that you're never out of stock, so you don't have to stop your production because you can't complete, complete some part of it because the supplies haven't arrived have the right level of economy of scale often large scale can be reduced to reduce cost or alternatively having efficient scale facilities um, having a smaller site that is efficient means you're not wasting money on rent um, one of the things um, for example that aldi do is exactly that effective delivery schedules low cost transport highly trained sales force and Proper pricing, pricing that enables you to make above average returns while meeting customers' expectations of adequate product for the right price. Aldi, Costco, probably fit a cost leadership strategy. Some would say that Aldi is a cost-focused um, strategy but it is more likely to be a cost leadership in the way it operates in Australia so we'll use that as a cost leadership example. Aldi and Costco are two examples that I've provided as video cases for you. How do you use cost leadership to address the five forces? Well the first force is rivalry among competitors. If you have an advantageous position in your cost that will make it less likely that a rival will attempt to compete with you on the basis of price because they know you can reduce their price to match their production costs or their new sales price. And the lack of price competition therefore leads to you making greater profits. If you have low cost in your operation, that better enables you to mitigate the power of suppliers because you're able to absorb the cost because of your low cost position of any price increases. And you're also, if you have the right scale, able to make large pur purchases, reducing the chance that suppliers will use their power over you because you are a large pur purchaser, therefore you have buyer power. You mitigate the bargaining power of buyers because you're driving prices below the competitors. That means that competitors may exit the marketplace, which reduces the choices of the potential buyers and brings buyers back to your firm. It acts as a barrier to entrance because you're already functioning at low cost and if you're using a large scale to be co competitive and that's the only way to be cost competitive a firm that enters the market needs to be able to enter in large scale similarly you've already moved down the learning curve because you've learned all these processes and invested R&D in every stage of your production to reduce your cost um, so you've moved down the learning curve they would have to move down the learning curve to match you. When you're moving down the learning curve, initially it's a higher cost, that acts, and therefore they'd be entering at a higher cost because they don't know as much about the market as you do. And if you've got products that meet the, the, the basic needs of the customers, and they are customers that are looking for cost leadership, that you're well positioned to protect yourself against um, substitute products. You can also buy patents of potential substitute, lower your price to maintain a value position, 
or make investments to be the first to create those substitute products. And you see firms that are multi-branded cost leadership and you think, well, I've got choice here in the supermarket or I've got choice somewhere else. But in reality, it's the same company making multiple brands. Colgate Palmolive do that all the time in in their um, clothes powder, their liquid laundry detergent and their powdered-based laundry detergent. There's really only three main manufacturers of those products. But there's dozens of brands, several of which are cost leadership, others the differentiation. So what are the risks of cost leadership? Well, firstly, the first risk is that the method that you're using to produce and distribute may become obsolete. This enables competitors to produce lower costs. Travel agents would be an example. Flight centre would be an example of that. Webjet is an example of that. Under significant pressure because the method of delivering is no longer the, is, is, is not the uh, method that might be needed. If you focus on cost reductions, you may end up um, getting to the point where you're no longer meeting the middle minimum needs and people are encouraged to produce, get a differentiated product which they perceive to be better. So they may start purchasing on differentiation. And while you have a set of core competencies that are producing cost leadership, other competitors may learn or have different core competencies that produce this uh, a better outcome. So they outcost lead you. Hey, let's do an olden day example from when we all had phone books. You remember phone books? Phone books used to be mass printed devices. You, the way that phone book companies got contracts to put, phone book printers got contracts to print phone books was because they had old equipment that had been completely amortized and they would do these large giant production runs and it was hard to produce because they had all these this economies of scale and efficient production. Then along comes computer based production. Along comes computer-based printing and, the, and any competitor can enter and scale very quickly to enter that marketplace. Okay, so that's the end of part 2A. What I'd like you to do is watch the video on Costco, watch the video on Aldi. They are both examples of cost leadership or possibly cost focus. And when we come back, we'll talk, look at our next um, business level strategy, which is differentiation.